Today's Gospel reading is probably one of the longer readings in the lectionary on a regular Sunday during the year, and as such, I'm going to break it up, uh, reading portions of it as we move through the sermon. Uh, It probably bears repeating, probably can't say it enough, that John's Gospel, from which this comes, is is written to a Jewish congregation, a congregation whose home is the synagogue and who value greatly their Jewishness, their Jewish heritage. And so when we hear in the passage something about the Jews that is negative, it is not speaking of all Jews, but merely of those authorities who are for John's community, threatening to throw them out of the synagogue. And now let us listen for what the Spirit would speak to us through these words of Scripture. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, night is coming, when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is not this the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying it is he, but others were saying no, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, a man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. Why is this man blind? asked the disciples. What caused this? Of course, they already have some pretty good assumptions about the cause. When they look at the blind man, they see him in a certain light. Why is this man blind? It has to be somebody's fault. There's some reason that he has to beg on the street corner in order to survive. Like those people we pass by with their signs as we drive along. It's somebody's fault. The disciples see the world in a certain way and so they see a man who deserves his fate in some way, at least indirectly. If he's not the direct cause of it, then he's the product of a bad family upbringing. But Jesus seems not to share the disciples or or my way of seeing the world. Jesus has little interest in determining fault but he does see an opportunity to show God's love moving in the world, to be light in the darkness while there is the chance. It's it's sort of an odd interaction. There's spit and mud and a command, go to Siloam and wash. The blind man hasn't even asked for Jesus' help. But when Jesus 
speaks to him, he obeys and does just as Jesus has told him. And he can see. No matter what it was that caused him to be blind, no matter what the reason that he was there at seven corners holding up his sign every day, he's healed, he can see. This is a wonderful, wonderful event. Surely all his friends and neighbors will be thrilled and happy for him and ready to celebrate. But many of his neighbors no longer seem able to recognize him. He looks vaguely familiar, but he's not a blind beggar. It must be someone else. Way back when I was in elementary school, there was a a girl with some significant learning and emotional challenges who sat right next to me. This was back in the 1960s, before there was a whole lot of sensitivity on such issues. This girl had few friends and struggled to keep up in class. It seemed likely she would have to repeat the grade One day, we had our weekly spelling test, and Kathy was so excited because she had spelled all ten words correctly. I knew better. I'd seen her glance towards my paper. I said something to the teacher. The the classmate behind me agreed that, yes, that's what happened. And so the teacher made her take the test a second time. She got them all correct again. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now, it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the man's parents and and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. Now the authorities get involved. Jesus, it turns out, has not followed proper procedures. It's a remarkable event, but something is amiss. Jesus has used unapproved techniques Something is funny and an investigation is needed to get to the bottom of this. Witnesses are called to testify, including the man's parents. What's going on here? What has happened? How is it this man can see? We know that he was born blind, say his parents, but that's all that we know. You'd think someone would be happy about this, would be ready to celebrate what has happened. Surely the man's friends and 
family, but no one seems able to see. No one sees this life that has been changed. No one sees God at work. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have already told you, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sin, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. The investigative committee is getting frustrated. They have to prove that God does not work this way. God, of all people, does not break the rules. God would not upset our religious tradition. God is bound to robes and sanctuaries and organ music. God does not undermine a well laid out committee structure or bylaws or the book of order. What do you mean God changed your life? Tell us what really happened. A curious thing happens during this investigation. The authorities grow more and more sure of their assumptions and their certainties, more and more confirmed in their blindness, while the blind man sees better and better, understands more and more. At first he thought Jesus was a prophet. Now he says he is from God. The investigation is at an impasse. Clearly the man is deranged. God does not work this way. Jesus heard that they had driven him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, I came into the world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would not have sin, but now that you say we see, your sin remains. Jesus heals blindness, but his presence renders some blind. The light that shines in the darkness is too much for some. 
they squint and they shield their eyes and they do not see. Jesus continues speaking to these Pharisees for quite some time beyond the limits of our reading for today. And as he does, he makes two of those I am statements that are a fixture of John's gospel. Uh, we cannot hear them in English, but, but the first readers of John's gospel would no doubt have heard echoes of the divine name. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and they know me. They will listen to my voice. Apparently, encountering God, encountering Jesus involves hearing as well as sight. The blind man hears Jesus, obeys Jesus before he ever sees him before he ever realizes who Jesus is. He hears and obeys and is changed. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great German theologian, says that this is what happens when people answer the call of Jesus to follow him. Bonhoeffer writes, if we would follow Jesus, we must, must take certain definite steps. The first step, which follows the call, cuts the disciple off from his previous existence. The call to follow at once produces a new situation. To stay in the old situation makes discipleship impossible. That's exactly what happens with the blind man. He does as Jesus said, and he is changed. And that change renders him unrecognizable to many. Even his family is ambivalent about these changes that have taken place. But the blind man sees and he believes and he worships Jesus. Nearly all the church people I have ever met want to be close to God. And that's surely true of every single person in the gospel reading that we have just heard. We all want to be close to God. But many of us, and that includes me on many and maybe most days, not really sure about being able to hear Jesus, much less see him. Like the Pharisees, we think that the best we can do is to read our Bibles a little bit, see kind of what God has in mind, and do the best we can on our own. If someone says to us, they have heard God speak, we are suspicious, as perhaps we should be. But Jesus insists that through the Spirit, he will abide in us. He says that the Spirit will speak to us and guide us, light leading us towards abundant life, towards fuller and deeper relationship with God. O oh Christ, give us ears to hear. O oh Christ, touch our eyes that your presence may not blind us but that we may see you clearly and follow where you lead us. Amen.